Hi, welcome to our next breakout session. Uh, again, I'm John Bottega, and I'm pleased to have running this session Peter Youngs from Orteca. Uh, the topic for this panel is trusting data to drive decisions, <clears throat> leveraging the DCAN framework. I've heard of that model, Pete. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm glad we're going to talk about that one in this session. Yeah, I thought um, you might, John. Yeah. Um, now, Pete, you've got the control, so I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining our panel discussion on trusting data to drive decisions by leveraging the DCAM framework. As John said, uh, I'm Pete Youngs. I'm a managing partner with Orteca. Uh, Orteca is a data management consulting firm and DCAM authorized partner operating in the UK, Europe, and USA. Uh, I'm really pleased to say we're joined by a fantastic group of data leaders who I will introduce uh, or let them introduce themselves in a moment. Before we do that, just wanted to explain the format for this panel today. So we're going to run through a, a few slides just to really briefly explain what DCAM is, uh, why we think you should care about it. Importantly, why it's not a silver bullet, uh, unfortunately, uh, but we do need to cover that. Uh, and then we'll open up our panel discussion and we'll get into some of the detail. So we have 30 minutes, including questions. So we'll probably move quite quickly. And so let's introduce our data leaders here today. I will let them introduce themselves. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, please, Rosh, over to you. No worries. Thank you, Pete. Um, so I'm Rosh Awatar. So hello, everyone. I'm the uh, interim group chief data and analytics officer at Lloyd's Banking Group, basically a uh, a leading financial services organization um, serving around 30 million customers across retail and uh, commercial customers across the UK. Thanks, Rosh. And over to you, please, Dan. Hi, thanks, Pete. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to some. Um, I'm Dan Green, Director of Data Management at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or EBRD for short, uh, a multilateral development bank that uses investment as a tool to build sustainable market economies. Thank you, Dan. And Lisa, please. Yes, good afternoon, Pete. Uh, my name is Lisa Dorsey. I'm a senior director at Fannie Mae over data governance and policy. Um, and Fannie Mae is a large US-based company that provides liquidity to the housing market, both renters and homeowners, uh, by guaranteeing mortgages and issuing securities. Nice to be here. Thanks, Lisa. And last but not least, of course, uh, my Orteca USA managing partner, Mark McQueen. Are you on mute, Mark? As Pete As said, I lead our team here in the US um, and partner very closely with the UK group. Um, come from a 22 year background with a GSIB that um, gives me the big experience, but uh, have had the luxury now in consulting with Orteca to work with various size organizations. Great, thank you. Well, welcome to you all. Um, I guess before we delve into some panel questions, um, let's just cover that background on uh, really what is DCAM. So DCAM is the data management capability assessment model um, it is created and it is owned by the EDM Council. It is their intellectual property. Uh, it serves two primary purposes. Firstly, it's a comprehensive data management framework that tells you what you should do to efficiently and effectively manage your data. Sometimes it's called a maturity model. I think it's important to say it's actually a capability model that explains uh, 136 in total low level data capabilities that you need. So it's quite detailed. There's a, there's a great deal of detail across the components that you can see in what we call the DCAM Frisbee on the right there, ranging from strategy, data quality, data governance, data control environment, al analytics, and so on. Uh, importantly, as well as being a framework, it's also an assessment tool as it has a scoring system built into it. I think this is a key differentiator for DCAM as few frameworks, if any, have such a comprehensive built-in mechanism with which to assess your level of capability. Uh, I think it's worth noting that DCAM is not just created by the EDM Council team. It's created, maintained, and extended by the EDM Council members. So it has global input from over 260 member companies and hundreds of individual data practitioners. 
So you could say it really is crowdsourced thought leadership and a great resource for every data practitioner. As we touched on at the start, uh, it is not a uh, silver bullet that magically provides trusted data and improved business decision making. There are steps we need to take. Uh, so we must see DCAM as a means to understand what we should do on data management and use it to assess our current state capability. Once we know our current state, we can define our desired target state of capability and then use DCAM to track our progress in achieving that target state, continuing to assess and measure. The real outcome is that we should be establishing sustainable data management capability that improves our data. It's all about improving the data. And with improved data, our business people, importantly, will be able to make better data-driven decisions and achieve better business outcomes, such as increased revenue and profit, improved processes and therefore efficiency, reduced risk and be able to cut cost. So our sole objective of using DCAM is ultimately to establish trusted and actionable data to drive better business decision making and outcomes. But it's no silver bullet. We've got to take the time to establish the capability, improve the data, obviously, to realize those business outcomes. So really, that's the background. Um, so let's uh, delve into the panel discussion. Um, that really tells us how uh, what DCAM is and how it can help us. Um, so just to call out uh, our data leaders here today, uh, where they are in their DCAM journey uh, and what outcomes they've achieved, we've got a spread of experience here. And I think this is important. So for example, Roche at Lloyds Bank have been using DCAM for a number of years, even establishing DCAM as a, a management board level metric. Dan at EBRD, uh, in the opposite to that, is just starting the DCAM journey, running an assessment now. Uh, Lisa at Fannie Mae has been using data capability uh, and maturity models for a while and has recently switched to use DCAM. Uh, so we've got a range there of long-term use, different models used and, and new to using DCAM. And Mark Orteca uh, has extensive experience of DCAM. He was the product owner, uh, helping EDM Council on that side for several years and has overseen numerous DCAM assessments and DCAM training. I have to say, as have I, I might add selfishly. Um, so let's start uh, with some questions. If we start with you, Rosh, um, maybe tell us why you chose DCAM, how you feel it's helped Lloyds Bank to improve data management capability? Okay, no problem, no problem. So I guess if we look at our journey from um, you know a few years ago, we're at a position where we, we really needed something to help us articulate how good or bad we were in terms of having the right capability in place to manage data. Because obviously we saw in the, over the last 10 years or so, the emergence of the Chief Data Office, you know, all the regulations, BCBS, but beyond that and beyond policy, there wasn't a, a real way to show, well, where are we on the scale? And it was quite um, easy, I guess, to take an insular view as to what good looks like. So we needed something relatively tangible that could t treat data management in its entirety as a whole versus just looking at lineage or uh, metadata or data quality but overall as a you know holistically how good are we um and the final thing there which actually made it quite a good choice um is that it's an industry benchmark so um and and, and i guess no execs really like being the back of the you know at the back of the uh, the bunch so that really provided you know a relative comparison against peers that people actually respond to versus, well, this is where you are on the scale, but this is where you are on the scale in comparison to others. So that that's really, I mean, why we chose, chose DCAM to give us that direction, you know, that structure in our thinking and helping us a roadmap, what to do, how to sequence it, where are the hotspots, where should we be investing? So it's really created that, I guess, the common dialogue and the common thinking around building capability. Um, and it's input focused, right? I mean, there are lots of different metrics to look at in output focus. You could say, well, how fast are we, you know, um, fixing data quality, but actually there was lacking, well, do you have the capability in the first place? And especially in quite a federated organization where you have lots of different, lots of fragmentation across the business to have something pull it together. So we're all moving in the same direction. We're all looking at capability in the same way and we have a common goal. So that, that's what really DCAM brought for us. 
Okay, so I guess the benchmark point is particularly important in that being able to say um, using the EDM Council benchmark that they run every couple of years, last one was 2020, so expect another one next year. Um, being able to say this is how we compare within our industry sector of GSIBs and so on is a powerful proposition, isn't it? Indeed. Okay, understood. Uh, so, uh, Dan, I guess we touch on uh, naturally um, current state, target state, and so on. I think Rush also touches on there the aspect of education and coherence. So I guess you're at the start of your DCAM journey. Is DCAM a fundamental sort of education tool? Do you see that side of it uh, with your colleagues? Yeah, very much so, Pete. Um, I think there's a, a combination of two factors mean that the EBRD does not have a, a strong data management culture. Um, first of all, the EBRD was a sunset organisation and, and not expected to have a lifespan of more than, more than 20 years. Um, second, as a supranational organisation, the EBRD is not subject to regulatory oversight. Um, so we're not required to conform to formal data governance programmes such as BCPS 239 or even GDPR. So as a consequence, data management has not been a priority for management and the bank now finds itself having to really play catch up. Um, which is why we joined the Enterprise Data Management Council and decided to undertake a DCAM assessment. And um, why did we choose DCAM? Well, for the reasons mentioned, data literacy at EBRD is low. And because, as you've described, Pete, that DCAM is a, a framework um, of capabilities, it, cr it creates that opportunity for me to showcase and describe to senior management and business stakeholders the actual capabilities that are needed to deliver effective data management in a modern organisation. Um, with the literary left, data literacy level so low, um, that's really been invaluable. So, you know, as data professionals, we all know good data doesn't happen by accident, that there's no magic, and that it can only really be delivered through a structured approach with well-defined processes and, and clear accountabilities. The yeah, DCAP okay. assessment means it's not just Dan Green telling my colleagues this, it's Dan Green supported by an evidence-backed objective assessment that's yes. based on a industry best practice methodology. So I think and you're then, right, it was about raising awareness um, and, and it's been a real learning opportunity. Yeah, and I guess that if we're data practitioners, I think sometimes we want to reinvent the wheel. Perhaps we think we can do better, but perhaps we shouldn't. We should check ourselves on that. There is member input, the data practitioner input into DCAM. So learn from what's there, apply it to your organization. And, and obviously you you should accelerate and you're not reinventing the wheel and, and spinning and wasting that time. Okay. So uh, Lisa, obviously we mentioned that you switched from a different capability model, maturity model to then start to use DCAM. Um, what, what made you do that? How did you see that DCAM would be uh, making a difference to you and ultimately, I guess, helping you to improve your data? Sure. Um, Pete, as you've mentioned, we uh, found tremendous value in the comprehensive nature of DCAM. With 136 sub capabilities and eight capabilities, it really allowed us to go to our data leads across Fannie Mae, and we had about 50 or 60 interviews and really probe into um, the data capabilities that they felt were lacking to help us identify our gaps. Um, so that was the primary reason. I, I will also mention that one of the key added capabilities to DCAM is the analytics capability. And Fannie Mae was in the process of really more aligning and, and tightly coupling our data and our analytics departments and teams. And that meant we wanted a more comprehensive assessment of that journey. Okay, thanks. So touching on that point again around um, the, the depth of granularity and the capability, really being able to help people understand what we should be doing uh, and obviously then reaching into understanding the gaps that you can close, um, that resonates. Um, thank you. So Mark, um, clearly we've got different levels of experience here. Um, what, what's your general view on when DCAM should be used and how, how easy is it to get started? Can any organization use it or should you have a certain level of data management capability first? Yeah, I think I'm going to reiterate some points that the other three um, thought leaders here have provided. Doesn't matter the size of your organization, doesn't matter how mature you are or you are not in data management. 
having having a framework that can be your north star this is this is a description of our target state and and being able to take the homegrown data practitioners that you're you're raising within your organization take some of those key hires that you've brought from outside your organization that have a lot of data management background and basically say i want you to take all of your experience and align it to this framework so that we're all building to the same direction. And then as far as doing an assessment tool, you know, I've seen organizations that were brand new Greenfield that have done an assessment and it's it's been a learning curve that, that they start on. Their scores may be extremely low and they expect them to be low because they've just started, but being able to sort of benchmark that learn from the experience and then and then move on in reverse i've seen some fairly mature organizations that have adopted dcan and give themselves extremely high scores before they really understand the complexity of dcan and and sometimes the second year around the, their scores actually go down you know because they've learned the complexity and how much has to go into this but then you see that hockey stick that all of a sudden their scores take off yeah, and they really right. start delivering. Okay. So you, any organization could use it. I guess it's just making sure you apply it in the right way. Think about how it will land in your organization. The point that Dan mentioned on data literacy, um, do they understand the framework? And obviously you can educate and help them to understand the framework and what the what your current state is and obviously then to derive your gaps. Okay. So I guess that that's why uh, you've all uh, started to use DCAM and so on. But if we focus in on the topic of the panel uh, and that we want to extend uh, the establishing sustainable capability into improving data to realize those business outcomes. Um, Lisa, is there any specific examples from within Fannie Mae where you've actually been able to take that all the way through and actually say, we established some capability on the back of DCAM and we did actually realize a business outcome? Because it's, it's difficult, isn't it, to actually tie it all the way back to the work that we might do in a chief data office. So I think we see this as challenging. Any, any particular successes or examples? Sure. Um, and building on my last comment, you know, we were really trying to link the data more closely to analytics. And so when we went through our assessment um, with the DCAM interviews, what we heard from our business folks is it's really challenging for me to access data that I need. It's really hard for me to figure out where that data lives within the large organization. Um, and so these were pain points and gaps that were identified. We leveraged the DCAM framework to set up a new process for our analytics and business folks to be able to get that data. We created a trusted data source. Uh, that trusted data lake was governed by a catalog of information so that it was easy for my business consumers to know where the data was and how to access it. And so something as simple as understanding what's in a given data set um, we can't assume that that exists across an organization. So we focused on making sure that the data was cataloged and defined. Um, the second major capability where we had a gap was on the data access. And so we worked to really standardize how the business folks could access the information and leverage it quickly. So we went from a two to three week cycle for access to a day and did it in a way that was very controlled and managed. And then the third thing that's most important is just data profiling. The business really needs to understand the profiling aspects, the data quality aspects. And so we really started to drive towards more automated profiling of that content. So I think the framework that DCAM espoused helped us set up um, our model for the analytics and business functions to be able to rapidly prototype and develop products. Okay, interesting. So with the analytics focus, I find the access point particularly interesting. If you've got access taking a couple of weeks and you've reduced that down to a day, you're just driving that. It feels like you're driving the data culture and access, obviously secure access, relevant access to the right data in a timely fashion. Okay, that, that's really good to hear. So uh, Ross, um, any particular successes uh, within Lloyd's? Uh, I know you guys have been doing lots on analytics as well. 
So I think if we talk about successes here, it's probably more intangible um, at my end in terms of the biggest thing that stands out um, because we made DCAM a board metric. So when we started the journey, we were able to actually associate our DCAM scores or targets to executive scorecards, which made a big difference um, in terms of the attention and profile it gave to data and data management. So, you know, traditionally, you've just got policy and the rest you have your best endeavors carrot. So uh, this time we had policy and a board metric. So that really, I guess, whether you liked it or not, many folk had to understand DCAM and as a result, understand data management. And more importantly, they understood it in the same way. Everyone was speaking the same language right it demystified you know what data was it created boundaries in thinking so i think for me the biggest success was actually just people understanding it right in terms of building capability absolutely provided more the guardrails around you know building capability versus transforming the capability because if i remind myself you know decams more around what you do not how you do it so you you know so it's really about complementing it with what how do you make it operationally effective as well as building the you know the right capability so i'd definitely say that is a a key success and now i mean um you know you say decam everyone knows what it you know knows what it is but in the future it shouldn't be about decam the word decam should fizzle out it's just data now so it's really been an enabler to get the engine going on people's understanding and awareness. And actually, there's probably more people who know DCAM than actually what data management was at one at some point in time. So we're pivoting that. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd okay. call that out as our biggest success. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So just having almost the acronym and the awareness of it being a board metric, it drove the data conversation that now you can reorientate back to, you knew about DCAM, this is all about data and how we can improve it and so on. So you can, I guess that is the softer side of helping to establish the data culture and data literacy isn't that so we're seeing a bit of a thread here clearly yeah and and you know and, and the fact that it was it wasn't just policy you know allowed us and i consider this a success to actually think about funding sometimes a little bit see um, you know differently because funding is all always a big you know that's a big task i always yeah. find it a big challenge to get you know funding and then people say funding for what what's the outcome what's the business outcome but having a board metric says well i can associate my delivery to needing the right data capability I need this data capability to put to to meet the board metric you've asked me to meet. Can I have some investment, please? So it, yeah. it, it, it accelerated and enabled some of those funding conversations as well. OK, interesting. I, I think there's a there's a Lloyds Bank case study actually on the EDM Council website, because um, I think that board metric has been a, a, a key success that clearly EDMC are calling out related to DCAM. So Dan, uh, I know you're you're newer to your DCAM journey. Perhaps you haven't uh, achieved the outcomes yet that you've got an eye on in the future. Is there anything particular, uh, I guess, in terms of improvements to data and those business outcomes that you've got one eye on? Um, sure, I mean, it's very interesting to hear um, Lisa and um, Rosh's views as well. And I, I'm, I'm encouraged by what, what, they've said, what, what they've said and what I've heard today. And we're still, completing our first DCAM assessment. So certainly we haven't achieved anything yet, but already DCAM facilitated that engagement with senior stakeholders and allowed, enabled that conversation. And the briefing sessions that um, Pete or Teca have run have provided an opportunity for us to raise awareness with, the, with key data contacts across the bank. So it's really facilitating that conversation. But in terms of specific areas, as a development bank, the EBRD process is huge amount of impact data, which is typically less well defined or rigorously controlled than financial and risk data. Um, that's changing with the increasing pressure that investment firms are facing from investors and regulators to integrate ESG and sustainability factors into investment processes. So that's where I'm really looking to use DCAM um, even more to build out that useful framework to develop data management capabilities around some of that more qualitative and subjective data that, that the EBRD processes. So I'm um, really encouraged by what I've heard today. Okay, great. So actually, as you get your DCAM results in and you build that roadmap, obviously balancing the build of capability with the, the, the impact you could make on your development impact data is gonna be the sort of business area that you focus on. Okay, interesting. Uh, and then Mark, from your 
any wider usage of DCAM across different clients, any specific successes on data improvement decision making that you've encountered? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief. One of the other panels that I just attended brought up the defensive versus offensive data management. And from a defensive standpoint, you know, conceptually, management reporting, regulatory reporting, if you don't understand your data and you have the same data field on two different reports, a finance a view of outstanding loan balance and a regulatory view of outstanding loan balance, and they're different. All of a sudden you've lost trust in your data because you haven't been able to explain that they're different for a reason and, and what that reason is. So I, I would identify that as a defensive. On the offensive side, you know, so many uh, institutions have tried to get that 360 view of a client that, that if we truly understood all the touch points to a client, that we'd be able to share, you know, get deeper wallet share into that client. And that's the one that's been so difficult because that data is horizontal across the entire organization. But if you achieve that, it can have a real drive to the bottom line. Okay, so if we if we said a data domain definition of customer, and then thinking about all the DCAM capabilities that we need to fully support that customer data domain, we could almost take a slice through DCAM you say, have we really got the capabilities in place that would support customer data? Uh, we could score those and we could track the improvement of those just to, to realize better quality customer data. Okay, that resonates. Um, I think we're, we're running out of time. Um, we wanted to just sort of call out key takeaways. So if, um, if there's one thing that you want our audience to remember about DCAM, clearly we've got some threads coming through here. Um, I think around data literacy, there's obviously something around senior leadership and getting that support because you can really get attention and traction with that. Um, Lisa, Dan, Roche, uh, any particular call outs, key takeaway for our audience? Yeah, I, I'd probably say, I mean, I didn't mention in the, in the call in terms of not making, you know, translating from data management spiel to business spiel. So when you're getting, getting that sponsorship, it's really important to be able to articulate as to why the business should care because it's very easy to get into the weeds of data management. That was a, definitely a key learning. Yeah, don't just treat it as a data management geek out. It's keep those business outcomes in mind. Dan, Lisa, yeah, Mark, anything I'd to add? Say, yeah, I'd yeah. certainly agree with, with Rosh's point there. With the, having Orteca partner with us has been very helpful, but you can't, we can't just leave it to Orteca and, and expect the organization to just jump into a DCAM assessment and understand what it's all meaning. You've got to hold their hand and explain and bring them on the journey and explain the relevance of this and the benefits that will come from, from undertaking this assessment. Um, it's an opportunity to, to engage across the business and it, it's working really well, but it's a lot of work. And, okay. and Pete, I'll just, yep. I'll just echo that, that it's really important. You know, your business folks, they have committed to giving you honest feedback and it's really important to take that information, distill it into a roadmap based on the data capabilities that are needed and to continue to communicate and communicate strategy changes and updates with them uh, to keep them on this journey. So just, just very quickly, yep. my, my comment would be use DCAM for all that it's worth. Yeah, it's a, it's a target state model. It's a training tool. It's an assessment tool that can drive capability uplift. And too often I see an organization just doing one of those things and not really getting the full value out of the framework. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's a couple of uh, questions that we've been fed through. So th there's one here around, um, we're a bit financial service focused here. Uh, so can DCAM be used by other industries, not just financial services. Mark, maybe is there, can you summarize that one? Yeah, there's uh, significant growth in council membership over the last three to five years outside in the, in the healthcare life sciences space. And you actually see in the chat that there's been an update to the benchmark you know, specifically within that industry. So if you're tied to that industry, take a look at that. Uh, automotive, manufacturing, uh, just data management is data management. So tremendous value of taking this 
And, and again, the offensive and the defensive, if you get out of a heavy regulated environment, you, know, you have the luxury of going offensive much faster. Okay, I know we could talk about this for longer, so we need to uh, wrap up to, to keep on time. So obviously, thank you very much to our data leaders for joining us today. Um, I guess if you have particular questions, um, I'm sure you could reach out to uh, the, the relevant person. Uh, Mark and I, especially from the Orteca side, happy to, to help you. If you want to book a discovery call with us, uh, the link is on the screen there. Uh, and we do have a, da a data leaders guide to DCAM that you can download as well that touches on that current target state and the roadmap in between. So thank you panelists, um, really appreciate you joining us today and audience, thank you for listening in. Um, thanks everyone and please enjoy the rest of Data Vision. Thank you, bye, thank you. Carol, you're on mute. I apologize. Thank you. So on the final on the final point, um, we now are moving back to the main stage uh, for the final wrap up um, and for the final raffle prizes. So if you wouldn't mind now connecting in to the final session for the last little wrap up. Thank you.